Support for the Nonprofit Lab comes from intentionality, the fact of being deliberate or purposeful. Intentionality, find it directing your mindset when it comes to thoughts, beliefs, goals, desires, and charitable giving. Welcome to the Nonprofit Lab, a podcast dedicated to the ongoing discovery of how we can all be a part of bigger social change through the lens of the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Puya Porak. I'm an industrial engineer, human-centered designer, and CEO of Match Dice, a social impact tech startup with a mission to connect the nonprofit ecosystem and maximize social impact. Thanks for joining us on our startup journey as we look to uncover and shake up the status quo in the world of nonprofits. My guest today is Stephen Kump, CEO of CharityVest, a donor-advised fund technology company making purposeful generosity more accessible and frictionless for all. Stephen has worked for over 10 years as a consultant to nonprofit organizations, philanthropists, corporate leaders, and private equity investors, most recently with Bain & Company. Stephen received his Bachelor's of Science in both Management and Economics from the Georgia Institute of Technology, my alma mater, and his MBA from Yale. Previously, he's worked at Booz Allen Hamilton, Calvin Edwards and Company, Bain and Company, and was a cavalry officer with the U.S. Army. I've been so excited to dive into the topic of donor advised funds on this podcast, and there's no better person I could think of to speak to donor advised funds than Stephen. According to their 2022 annual report, Charity Vest is now the largest by number of accounts and fastest growing donor advised fund sponsor in the world. And 2022 was a record year for Charity Vest in nearly every category, with contributions to their donor advised funds growing by 93% to $48 million, with 19 million of that being sent to over 5,000 charities across all cause areas on at least six continents. In this episode, we'll cover how Charity Vest is democratizing donor advised funds and cover the basics like what a donor advised fund is and how they work, why donors should consider creating a DAF account, how nonprofits can engage donors with DAFs, the ethics and misconceptions about DAFs, and the future of collaborative giving through DAFs. Let's jump right in. Here's our conversation. Stephen Kump, welcome to the Nonprofit Lab. How are you, sir? Hi, Pete. It's great to be here. I'm doing well. It's great to have you. I'm really excited about this conversation. I think it was like one of our very first episodes of the Nonprofit Lab where I said, oh, we really got to dive into the world of donor advised funds. And here we are many here episodes are. later <laughs> speaking okay. to someone who knows very, very much about uh, donor advised funds. But before we get there, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found yourself working in and supporting the nonprofit sector. Oh, that's awesome. Well, it's great to be here and, and love what, what you all are doing. And so glad to be in this conversation and spread the good word about uh, donor advised funds for sure. Uh, most people in America still don't know about donor advised funds. So if anybody listening to this is in the camp of like, actually, what are those? Maybe I've heard the name. Uh, there are more people in your camp than not in your camp. So uh, rest assured, you are uh, just like most folks. Uh, but I want to change that on today's conversation. So uh, I got into donor advice funds because, because I became a philanthropy advisor. I was a management consultant. And like many people in management consulting, ended up wanting to do something a little bit more uh, direct toward having a positive impact on the world, or at least feeling like I was. And so I got into philanthropic advising, helping major donors and high net worth families um, be more strategic with the resources they were deploying in the charitable sector. And uh, that's where I first learned about donor advice funds. I actually didn't know they existed until I became a, a, a philanthropy advisor and very, very quickly saw how powerful they were. And also very, very quickly saw 
their limitations, which ultimately Charity Vest, my startup, um, is addressing, which we can get into a little bit later. Yeah, well, similar to to many listeners, donor advised funds were something that just weren't at all on my radar until I started our journey of discovery in the nonprofit sector. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this is the fastest growing philanthropic vehicle in the United States. And there's just billions of dollars in uh, these donor advised funds accounts across all of these different sponsors. So let's break down, let's help, help us understand what is a donor advised fund? How do you get one started? Like any history around it would be great. Uh, just give us the 101. Totally. DAS 101, here we go. Let's see if we can do it in like two or three minutes. Uh, we'll see. So, okay. So donor advice funds actually have been around a long time. They were started in the 1930s. The first donor advice fund sponsor was the New York Community Trust. And uh, there are different versions of the story that you might hear, but I think more or less the reason why donor advice funds were created is because there were some you know high net worth people that ended up having a significant windfall in a in a singular tax year and they wanted an alternative to setting up private foundations even in those days private foundations were relatively new um and and so uh donor advice funds were created at, uh, and sort of sanctioned uh by the u.s government um within the new york community trust the first sponsor to be an account in which tax deductible funds could be held and a donor could advise, that's where the word donor advised comes from, advise, continue to advise on where the funds ultimately go. So they're actually the property of a charity. So Charity Vest Inc. being a donor advised fund sponsor, all the assets inside of our DAS are legally ours, not the donors, but we let the donors continue to advise on those assets. So that's a little bit of the history and kind of structure. Um, how do donor advised funds work? So if you're coming off the street and you're like, how, how does this thing work? What, what's in it for me? Donor advised funds are essentially just a tax deductible account. The way to think about it is like a 401k, but for charity. So you put money into that account, just like a, your checking account or 401k, and the money is tax deductible the second it hits the account. You actually don't have to send it on to a charity and yet for it to be tax deductible. Um, the money can flexibly sit there uh, or be invested in whatever you'd like it to be invested in. And it can grow tax-free for as long as it is in the account. Um, and then whenever you're ready, whether it be five minutes or five years later, um, you can go in and send that money to any U.S. 501c3 uh, public charity or place of worship um, from the account. And it's all on one tax receipt at the end of the year. So most people like to use donor advised funds because of that flexibility, maybe because they don't really know what to give to yet, but they want to commit some of their resources to charity. Uh, maybe because they have a business windfall uh, that would fund like the next 10 years of their charitable giving, but it's ad tax advantageous to put it aside now and kind of slowly give it away over the next 10 years or uh, a similar kind of tax uh, optimization that they're doing. Uh, some people just want to streamline all of their giving in one place on one tax receipt because they support 10 different charities and they're tired of like keeping track of tax receipts. Donor advised funds address that. And then uh, probably the most popular reason actually is because people want to donate appreciated stock. So uh, giving appreciated assets like stock or cryptocurrency or mutual funds or even like real estate is significantly tax advantage for donors. Um, so whenever you have an asset that goes up in value, when you sell it, you pay capital gains tax on the increase in value to the U.S. government. Well, if you donate that asset before you uh, sell it, you actually don't have to pay those capital gains taxes and you get an income tax deduction for the value of the asset you donate. So it's like double whammy from a tax perspective, no capital gains tax and an income tax deduction. So if you have stock, mutual funds, cryptocurrency, and they've gone up in value, very advantageous for donors to donate those instead of cash. And as you can imagine, not every charity <laughs> that is on you know, mainstream America has the ability to accept stock or cryptocurrency contributions and donor advice funds are really, really good at it. And you only have to do it once and you can support any number of charities with that one stock uh, or cryptocurrency contribution uh, all from that one account. Um, so those are kind of the main like four reasons or so why people would use a donor advice fund. 
And Charity Vest has been at the forefront of helping to democratize donor advised funds for like everybody. Because I think in my early research, it was abundantly clear that donor advised funds traditionally seem to be known about and reserved for ultra like high net worth individuals. And the benefits of having that immediate tax write-off was, you know, it's very appealing. And in, in, like you said, like in situations where someone uh, with high net worth might have like a windfall, um, but you're looking to change that. You're looking to like your target customer is just the everyday American. Can you talk about the process of like how you identified that as an opportunity and the trends that you're seeing in donor advised funds kind of becoming more mainstream and, and the role that Charity Vest has played in, in supporting that movement? Yeah, there's a couple of things to unpack here. What a great question. And thanks for teeing up uh, Charity Vest so well. Um, so a couple of things to unpack. Um, first of all, you know, donor advised funds are here to stay and they're quickly becoming like a larger and larger force in philanthropy. So they're growing like 40% a year and a greater and greater share of all of charitable giving is going through donor advised funds. By some estimations, this past tax year, it may be as high as 20% of all charitable giving it, uh, went through uh, donor advised funds or into donor advised funds. So significant forces only becoming a greater share. Um, so that's like point number one is like they are becoming a bigger deal and they are getting democratized um, and get, spreading to more people. Uh, second, you're exactly right. They they were really a ultra high net worth product for a long, long time. Uh, and there were barriers. And that was one of the main uh, issues that I feel like Charity Best needed to address. You know, the donor advice fund industry, I would say as a whole has become democratized, but I didn't feel like it was moving fast enough and people were thinking about it drastically enough to where not only, you know, were they not democratized to lower income strata, but also there were a lot of high income people that felt like they were complex and cumbersome. And even though they would be a tight fit through economics, behaviorally, they weren't jumping in. And so I felt like there was a lot of white space need to be addressed that simplicity and beauty and design and lower fees would uh, help accelerate. So that's really where Charity Vest comes in. We wanted to create a donor advice fund experience that was incredibly simple and intuitive and flexible and low fee all at the same time to where, you know, uh, many of the, the sort of financial services, modern financial services like uh, Wealthfront or Betterment or uh, personal capital um, that many of folks, millennials and, and Gen X are like used to or like premium digital financial experiences, we wanted to bring that toward in, into donor advised funds. We didn't feel like anybody was addressing that. So uh, that's where Charity Vest comes in. And the last thing I want to just maybe state the obvious, maybe some folks are like thinking about like, wow, okay, when you talk about the value of donor advised funds earlier, there was a lot of terms, there was a lot of like legalese and like that felt a little bit complex. Yeah, donor advised funds are a little bit complex and that's like something we need to embrace. And, and I think basically just pours uh, the gas on that fire that we just talked about of like, yeah, they're complex and they need to be simplified because there's like baked in complexity. I think it makes it even more urgent that simplicity and, and sort of like beautiful onboarding, intuitive onboarding experiences to activate people in them matter even more. So that's just a little bit of the urgency and the heartbeat behind what we're doing. And I, of course, checked out charityvest.com, your website before this episode and you all have done a really great job of having video tutorials and explanations of explaining exactly like the what, what is a DAF, how does it work, um, and really answering some of the common questions that that folks might have. And maybe to illustrate, because you did a really great job of explaining all the different capabilities, the nuances, some of the legalese, as, as you mentioned, but like to put it into a story, like I could go to Charity Vest and open an account, deposit let's say a thousand dollars, I get an immediate tax write off on that thousand dollars. That thousand dollars can then be invested in the market and accrue interest or, or, or gain more capital. And let's say over the course of a year, that thousand dollars becomes, I'm just making numbers up here, $1,200. And then at the end of the year, I'm able to request that pool of money that I've 
put into my donor advised funds to be donated to as a grant to specific nonprofits of my choice. Does that kind of paint the story of like how a donor advised fund works? Yep. That totally tracks to you. You're exactly right. Um, so yeah, you put money in, you can invest it, it can grow, it grows tax-free even. And then whenever you're ready, you can take the money and, um, and request it be sent to any charity. And as long as it kind of meets our policy, which is basically like, it has to be a 51 C3 in good standing with the IRS. Um, you know, we send it on to the charity. Well, I, I want to pivot the conversation in a moment to discussing how nonprofits can best position themselves to uh, be the recipients of grants from donor advised funds. Um, but before we get there, I, I want to address a couple of the concerns that I've had around donor advised funds in, in just the macro space of, of DAFs. And I think Charity Vest has done a great job of being very cognizant of these things. But you said, for example, like 20% of all giving is going into DAFs. But then the question is, like, how much of that is being dispersed back into the sector? I think yeah. one of the things that we saw during the pandemic was so many nonprofits were cash strapped and just desperate for capital to keep their doors open. And uh, donor advised funds got this huge spotlight because they were at that time, over $8 billion just sitting there um, that the sector could have really used. And I know different uh, sponsoring organizations, DAFs like, you know, Fidelity, uh, Vanguard, you know, Charles Schwab Charitable, all these organizations have a flavor of their own DAFs with their own fees and their own rules. But you mentioned earlier that, you know, me putting my money into a donor advised fund kind of, I legally relinquish the power of that capital to you. I have the ability to make a request for my funds to be dispersed. But what we've seen um, in, in some legal action that's happened from donors is donors saying, hey, I want to contribute all my donor advised funds, or I want to contribute a majority of mine. And the sponsoring organization being able to just say like, sorry, no. So can you talk about like, a couple of things. There's a lot to unpack in this kind of narrative of a question, but just like your perspective on the responsibility of DAF account holders to get the money that's in these accounts into the sector, like what minimum disbursements look like, and just the power dynamic between a DAF holder and the ability to make uh, these grants. Yeah, there's a there's a couple layers to your question, uh, Puya. One one is sort of like, what what are the donor advised fund ethics as a sponsor? Like, what does it look like to be a, a, a responsible donor advised fund sponsor, uh, to where we're only creating value and not sort of extracting value from the system, um, which I think is a really important question. And of course, um, we have a perspective on that. Um, and I think the second big question in what you asked is like, if you're a charity, how should you feel about this? Uh, like let's say you're a fundraiser and uh, yeah, you see all this money sitting there. How should you think about that and, and feel about it? And, and then maybe like, what should you do? Like what, what should your takeaways be about kind of this donor advised fund trend? And maybe we can speak to, to both of those or anything else that kind of pops up. Uh, yeah, we, we take our responsibility at Charity Best, like super simple or super seriously, I mean. Uh, that uh, we do have a responsibility to make sure that the dollars go out the door as quickly as possible. We're really proud in uh, 2022 that our payout rate was 56%. The industry average is 27. So we were you know, more than double the average payout rate. Um, and if you're curious, you can go Google payout rates. There's a whole debate about um, what donor advice fund payout rates should be. Uh, private foundations have a minimum legal payout rate. Um, donor advised funds do not, um, but the payout rate for private foundations is much, much lower than donor advised funds. Um, that's where uh, a lot of the debate swirls um, in the space. But you're right. There, there's a lot of resources sitting there. And kind of my perspective on it, and this is a, a philosophical perspective, we can talk practically what this means in a second. But philosophically, I think as soon as that money can go to a high impact charity in the clear conscience of that donor that originally contributed and is advising on it, it should. And so how do we help, um, how do we prevent any friction from that occurring as soon as the donor is ready? 
And then second, how do we encourage that donor to get clarity about, you know, what they want to advise that money toward? Um, those are kind of the two things that I think a, a, an ethical DAF has to address. What are you doing about those two things? And then there's some practical things like we, we have stale DAF policies at Charity Best. And most donor advised funds do, you know, some, some are very uh, aggressive about enforcing them. Some are a little bit more lax. Uh, but yeah, we have policies that if for some reason a donor abandons their money, we don't let it sit there forever. And uh, we take action to mobilize that money toward the charitable sector. Um, so we only want money. We only want money to sit inside of Charity Fest or any donor advised fund uh, because there's value of it sitting there. If, if, if that money is no, like creating less value sitting there than it would uh, going forward. And I know people might hear that and say like, wait, what do you mean? Uh, you know, that money needs to go to charity now. Uh, I hear you. Uh, but ultimately we're talking about the future giving journey of that donor. And that's a big part of the donor advice fund experience. Remember that that donor, one of the main reasons they might have that money in a donor advice fund is they don't know what to give it to, they they don't have a connection to a charity. And uh, so they said, hey, I'm gonna give it to a donor advice fund. So the counterfactual is actually, they don't give it all. But remember now that money is committed to the charitable sector forever, can't come out, which I think is a really important zero to one that donor advice funds are encouraging. Um, and so now let's transition the conversation a little bit into the fundraisers. See, you're a fundraiser. How should you feel about this kind of growing donor advice fund monster. Based on what I just said, and so many donors who I think are, we'll call them pre-activated, or a portion of their money is like pre-activated toward a, a, a cause, I think you should, you should have your hat on of like how to help your donors connect with your cause and be aware of which donors, if, they've, if you have a way to track this or if they've afforded that they have a donor advice fund, to have like clear conversations about like their giving strategy, like whether it fits your organization tightly or not. Some people are afraid to ask kind of like meta questions that may lead down a road of like, oh, they're not going to give to my organization. But I think that's so, so important to build like deep bridges with your donors is like supporting them as an advisor to their impact writ large, whether it's your organization or not. Um, uh, one of my favorite organizations, uh, Hope International, it's an international development organization. Um, they have a view in their fundraising office that their job is to help uh, help their, their donors along their sole journey of giving, whether it impacts their organization or not. Um, and if their like, organization is not relevant to partnering with that donor and what they feel called and, and sort of convicted, uh, to see in the world, then they encourage that donor to go elsewhere, which I think is such a cool abundance mindset. And donor advice funds naturally, like way more naturally are part of that conversation uh, because it's ultimately about like, hey, you have resources, what should we do to mobilize them toward impact? And of course, as you can imagine, when you have that abundance mindset, so much of that comes back on their own organization and donors are so happy to support and like proactively look for opportunities for how they're you know, once they get clarity on kind of the impact they want to have, how that can fit into Hope's uh, mission and, and programs and activities. So I, I really think there's a bridge to be built between fundraisers and donors who have donor advised funds. And certainly we at Charity Vest want to build more and more tools that enable that and catalyze more of that conversation. So I know that was a lot. We talked about ethical donor advised funds. We talked about fundraisers and engagement with donor advised funds. But, um, but I've what my big takeaway here that I would encourage folks to to hear is like donor advice funds are taking steps. Certainly we are to to be ethical and encourage dollars out the door. And second, um, fundraisers can play a more, it's not kind of a, it's it's not a secret topic. Uh, uh, we encourage you to have donor conversations with your donors about their donor advice funds. And I so appreciate the role that Charity Vest is playing and not only democratizing donor advised funds to any, like every American that uh, is philanthropically minded and has the capacity to, to be, uh, but also the, what you said around payouts and like being double the national average. I think that's the thing that like shocked me was in finding out that there are many uh, DAF 
sponsors out there that are just really doing the minimum to kind of maximize their holdings. Uh, but I, I love that you're part of this wave of working to put that capital to to good use and seeing that impact. And I really appreciate the way that you address that semi-difficult kind of direct question head on and uh, are are living through kind of that, the, your values in that with Charity Vest and everything that you're doing. Yeah. On the, the second point about, you know, how nonprofits can really be stewards of donors who have donor advised funds. I, I love the approach of serving and, and working towards just the higher good uh, of Hope International and kind of their approach of saying, well, you know, what are you interested in? And I think every nonprofit that is uh, has some fundraising 101 experience knows that part of the donor co cultivation cycle is to understand your donor's interests, motivations, passions, causes they really care about. Uh, but I, I don't think it's very often taught to say like, oh, if if there's not alignment, like point them to another charity that might be. I think doing something like that might even encourage a donor who's not a mission aligned to be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I'll donate to them uh, just because they're being a consultant to me. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you because you did play that nonprofit like fundraising consultancy type role. What are some other tactics that nonprofits can apply to like how do you even identify a group of donors that have donor advised funds is it just as simple as talking to your donors and saying hey do you have a DAF or like like what's the best way to tap in because it still feels like this kind of gray area maybe they have one maybe they don't maybe don't they've never heard of a DAF like can you talk about strategies of like identifying like a greater share of potential revenue as a nonprofit from DAFs yeah Okay, so this is such a great question, Pia. Um, and it sort of gets me excited about going and producing some like blog posts and videos of our own around this. So uh, there's two buckets um, that I would I would say that you as a nonprofit should be able to tell um, who is giving to you from a donor advice fund. Your administrative staff should know this. Um, you'll get checks or electronic disbursements and data um, from donor advice funds uh, with from the grants from donor advice funds. And usually, unless the donor has proactively said, hey, I want to be anonymous, you'll have that donor's information as well. Um, so you can kind of keep, keep a tally of the folks that you know have donor advice funds. And what I would just encourage is to say, uh, ask those donors uh, what their kind of broader giving um, strategy or uh, impact thesis is maybe they wouldn't use those terms, but uh, you kind of know what I'm saying of like talk to them about the broader impact that they want to have with their lifetime, especially if you suspect there might be a larger balance in those funds. Don't presume there is because a lot of donors, um, you know, put money in and then send all, send it all out um, out of donor advice funds and other donors might have uh, millions of dollars in their donor advice funds. So that's like point number one. Um, track it and ask those donors. Um, you know, about their donor advice fund and about kind of their, uh, if they've thought about a, a broader kind of impact portfolio and what that might be uh, kind of lifelong with the money in their donor advice fund. It's it's not like a, I, I would just say as a, a philanthropy advisor and a, folks that worked with many, many uh, fundraisers, it's it's not as a weird of a topic to bring up as, as you might think. Uh, uh, number number two is, uh, I, I think in the, under the, the umbrella of like, what value can you add to potential donors just broadly, as we were talking about earlier and kind of advising them generally, whether that's your organization or not, ask them if they've ever thought about a donor advice fund, uh, bring it up because as most donors, if they have, um, you know, give with any significant amount, a uh, donor advice fund can be extremely tax advantageous to them um, or at a minimum kind of cut down on the administration of their giving because they can give it all in one place, one tax receipt. Um, and especially appreciated assets uh, can really simplify things. Um, so that's number two is like en encourage them to use one uh, that, that, you know, that feels like you're taking a step back. But I think it, it you know, even if administratively, it's not a tight of an integration with like, say you have like, your online giving stack, um, you might have some manual entry, but I think it's one step back and two steps forward um, with the relationship of that, that donor. Um, Number three is I think you should 
always be having conversations about appreciated assets. Uh, have you thought about giving appreciated assets? Because it's a basically a way, if, they, if you think this donor has appreciated assets or they tell you they do, um, if they're giving $1 today, that is a really easy way to just turn that $1 into $1.20. Uh, because they're avoiding capital gains tax, they, they're, they're more likely to be able to benefit from income tax deductions if they give appreciated assets. Um, and so that's, that's just a really easy zero to one. We just made their giving more tax efficient. And guess what? That money is now going to charities and hopefully your charity as opposed to Uncle Sam. So uh, those are just some like practical thoughts on like ways to engage with donors around uh, donor advice funds that ultimately will benefit, you know, your charity. Super practical and, and also very tactical. So I appreciate you breaking that down so, so eloquently. Earlier in our in our conversation, you know, you, you mentioned that many nonprofits may not be equipped or set up to accept crypto or appreciated assets. Like if if uh, if we're speaking to the grassroots nonprofits, those that are earlier on right now that are interested in and in kind of opening their horizons of what kind of gifts and donations they can accept, what advice do you have for those folks, particularly around um, these appreciated assets? Yeah, uh, you know, kind of drafting off of what I said earlier, it's it's just a an easy way to get more money out of your existing donors for like not really any additional charitable commitment uh, because money is just kind of because it's just becoming more tax efficient. Um, that money can just come to you instead of instead of the government. We're happy to kind of unpack how that works economically. I don't think it's worth going into the numbers okay. here, but like reach out to us. We would love to talk you through. Um, kind of the mechanics of that and, you know, make you smart as you um, talk to donors. But that's like just drafting off of that. It, it really is like a no brainer opportunity to educate your donors on appreciated assets. Um, so that's the, the what, um, you know, the, the who might be like any donor that, you know, gives or you believe has capacity to give, you know, I would say five, five or 10,000 or like more anywhere from that range and up. So pretty, pretty broad range of donors. Uh, you, you should be having an appreciated assets conversation. Mm. That's my artificial like line to draw there. So could be less, could be more, but, um, but that, that's sort of, you should, you should bring that up. If they, if you're not sure if they've donated appreciated assets before um, you should, you should bring that mm. up because it, because it will make them more intentional. Uh, and then, and then the how question. So what, who, how, um, how you, you need a way to accept any of those appreciated assets and, and sort of large sophisticated charities, you know, set up their own uh, crypto wallets, they set up their own brokerages and have operations to receive those. Um, but there's kind of two considerations. One is, is that really what you want to be doing with your time? Uh, and then, uh, you know, and it's, it, it is complex. Two, uh, you know, like you said, kind of maybe, maybe your small town main street uh, up and coming charities, they, they don't have, the bandwidth to even set one up or, or the know-how. And I think you got to find a solution. Well, donor advice funds are nice because they are an out of the box, like ready to receive your donor solution today. And they are really good at it. Um, so our, ourselves and any other major donor advice fund sponsor do this, uh, you know, many, many times every day we, we receive appreciated assets and we're really good at it. And importantly, we produce all of the tax substantiation paperwork uh, for the donor. So that burden is totally off your organization completely. And then they just grant to your organization out of the donor advice fund, you receive cash. So they get the tax benefits, you receive cash. So it's like not complex at all. Um, and it's a win-win for everybody. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, I think you're maximizing the lifetime value of your donor. We as a donor advice fund sponsor are delighted to serve that donor because likely they're going to like the experience and continue to give with us, mm -hmm. um, support your charity. And, and, uh, and kind of the last thing that I'll mention is most donor advised funds, uh, and certainly ourselves, we don't charge any fees for that. Uh, so it's literally free. Somebody donates, you know, $10,000 of appreciated stock. We're going to send every cent of that $10,000, uh, to your organization. If they, if the donor chooses to, to grant, um, so it, it, it really is kind of a no brainer, in my opinion, to start that conversation and have a solution. And donor advice funds are kind of ready made uh, to, to help on day one. 
Well, thanks for educating me on even just that topic, uh, something I'm very unfamiliar with, but I feel a lot more uh, understanding of now. One uh, like clarification, when we get to talking about the category of appreciated assets, there's stocks, of course. What are some other like types of appreciated assets that donors could could give? Yeah, it really is anything that has value, to be honest with you. But the most popular, for sure, stocks and ETFs and, and bonds. Uh, mutual funds would be kind of the second bucket. Um, and then uh, cryptocurrency would be the third, just in terms of volume. Uh, where crypto is that that in terms of the dollars has, has dropped off a bit, but uh, but beyond that, um, you really get into what is typically called complex assets or mm. illiquid assets, and uh, that does the, these do require a little bit uh, more kind of involvement. But if you have significant holdings, um, you know that you're going to sell. Let's just say you have a large tract of real estate that um, you know uh, that you've held for a while and is extremely appreciated. Um, and it's not your primary residence, so you will be cap you it will be subject to capital gains tax. Um, maybe you want to donate that tract of land um, rather than uh, sell it and pay all that capital gains tax. Um, and that could essentially fund you know the rest of your giving life forever and yeah. maybe create a charitable legacy for your kids that they can be involved in. So they can kind of go into your state planning. Uh, we can, and other donor advice funds can facilitate those gifts. So uh, just to answer your question more directly, real estate, uh, private stock in a, in a company, whether it's a C-Corp, S-Corp, LLC, you name it, um, restricted stock uh, as well in a, in a public company, um, employee equity awards, especially if it's a public company. Um, if you know, you're know part of tech companies is typically where and um, we see this, we see a lot of like Google and Facebook employees like donating their equity awards um, uh, through Charity Vest. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, there's a bunch of these, you can you can actually donate fine art uh, yeah. if, you, if you have fine art. So yeah, it sort of gets into the, the more and more complex uh, niche world from there. But I think we covered a yeah. lot of the big ones. Well, uh, thanks for kind of opening the perspective on that. I I, I asked that to kind of, broaden the idea of like what all could could be donated beyond just like the check that is the common yeah. uh, donation so i appreciate you enlightening us on that you know we've talked a lot about what donor advised funds are how they work why they can be super impactful i'm curious to hear from you what are some of the most common misconceptions that you've heard or are hearing about donor advised funds from donors and uh, nonprofits? Yeah, what a great question. Um, we've already talked about a few of them, you know, the donor advice funds are like holding on to the money um, is one that is commonly in the news cycle. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, for, for many consumers, they they trip over the fact that like, you know, the, the money is tax deductible when I send it to a charity. Um, so educating them that like, hey, it's actually tax deductible when it hits the account first. Um, so folks who have never heard of donor advice funds, usually that takes a second to like sink in. Uh, so we really hammer that home um, with donors. Um, let's see what else. Um, I, I would say there's a common misconception uh, in donor advice funds. I think because it has been white glove and, and sort of ultra high net worth focus for so long, there's a bad misconception that donor advice fund experiences and kind of creating a donor advice fund is like this really complicated thing. And I need to like have a financial advisor involved. Answer is like no, uh, and hopefully you know Charity Vest is like blowing this up completely. You come to Charity Vest to create an account it takes like sixty to one hundred and twenty seconds. Um, you, you have a donor advice fund at that point. You can link your bank, you can link your credit card, and like be underway and like start giving. Um, so we they, it does not have to be complicated. Um, and we even try to call it a giving account just to like simplify the language and sort of make it. Um, uh, sort of more accessible. Um, the last thing I would say, what comes to mind is that uh, donor advice funds are like for wealthy people and tax reasons alone. Um, and and I, I, I kind of am passionate about this, uh, you know, and, and this applies even for wealthy people actually, that like uh, that giving is about more than just dollars out the door and tax advantages and and we should really kind of broaden the conversation and, and let me give you one example 
giving is an opportunity to enhance your relationships with people. And of course, like your relationships with people you want to partner with out in the world who are good, doing good things. Sure. But even other donors, your ability to like get together with friends and like contribute to something meaningful together really has a way of like binding people together in like a higher order pursuit in life and creates a dimension of friendship and, and partnership that like you, that's hard to replicate. Uh, and hopefully people will resonate with what I'm saying. It's so like with donor advice funds, part of what we're creating it, in for passion, but to create in 2023, this isn't live yet, but the ability for donors to collaborate in donor advice funds together, where like you and I could create one, and we both contribute to it in a common pool and decide together where it's going to go. And that could be just like, you know, because we're friends and we get together periodically and want to do that, or it's because we're a part of a more permanent community that's passionate about it a certain certain cause and is really trying to drive resources toward you know certain organizations that are trying to drive a particular change in the world so um that's something we're maybe a misconception that we're super passionate about changing too is like giving is about more than just dollars and cents it really can be about relationships and legacy and and other things that, that make life richer and love that S Stephen. you just talked about this idea of community funds and mission aligned donors banding together around a cause. And I think it's a great way as well to kind of multiply the power of an individual group's giving capacity into a larger sum. For example, let's say like me and 10 friends are, are all like, Hey, let's all throw in a hundred dollars. Now we have a thousand dollars between us to decide where that goes. Can you talk about what charity vest is doing to kind of enable that level of community or things that you guys are thinking about on your roadmap around that? Yep, totally. And, and as you've heard for a lot of this conversation, really trying to make donor advised funds better. And now we're in a version, kind of a chapter of our history where we're trying to help donor advised funds do things that they've never been able to do before, new capabilities for donor advised funds. And community funds is kind of our first flagship example of this. Donor advised funds have never had the ability, the ability for people to seamlessly contribute into a donor advised fund together, purpose built for um, giving together. They've sort of had workarounds for like donors to contribute to other donors as funds, but like having a third fund that's like not mine, not yours, but ours um, is totally new. And, and that's what we're working on today. So community funds are a social donor advised fund that exists on a particular web page. People can share the link and folks can seamlessly jump in and contribute to that common pool. Um, of charitable capital. And it's tax deductible to you individually, but the money shows up collectively for everyone. And there's a, a set of kind of a person or a set of people who are the fund managers. Um, the person that created it essentially is the first fund manager that can add other fund managers. And they decide where the grants are going to go. They might be just an administrator that kind of carries out the wishes of the collective or they might be an expert and really are the ones kind of driving the decisions of like where the resources are going. We love both of those models and both of those models like bring people together. Um, and then uh, lastly, the on that web page, all of the transactions are completely transparent, which is kind of an important part of the experience of like everybody gets to see where every dollar is going and as much information as the donors want to contribute about themselves, um, that will also be available. So they can certainly be anonymous or they can say, hey, I've I've supported this fund and I'm, I'm willing to put my name behind it. Um, so we really, that kind of creates this like transparent level power, um, democratized social giving experience as well. I absolutely love that idea. It's, it's, it's an idea that's kind of come up over and over again um, at Mass Nice in terms of how do you empower and enable a community of givers to kind of band together. And I love that Charity Vest is really on the leading edge of enabling that. I'm I'm curious from a technical perspective, how how do you view the integration of donor advised funds accounts with other giving platforms, with corporate giving, with social media? Like how does donor advised fund like the the tech behind that continue to like integrate and and like the tentacles to get out there for folks to like it it just becomes a natural part of the giving environment because right now it feels like it's this separate thing, but it, it you know, I think there's this seems like there's a big opportunity to further those connections between other giving channels. 
No, you're exactly right. Pui. I mean, I, I think the the reason why donor advice funds have been a separate thing and haven't really been integrated is technology. Like there hasn't been like a good way for them to serve use cases because the tooling was lacking. Um, not because they legally can't or structurally couldn't add value. It's just like there wasn't tooling to where somebody could to tweet a link and say, hey, contribute to my fund um, for good, you know, for this cause and I'll match and double everything that you all put in it. Um, I don't know about you, but certainly when uh, you know, summer 2020 when Black Lives Matter was uh, at, at the forefront of cultural conversations, so many people were jumping on social media and saying, um, hey, I, I want to raise support for this justice organization. Um, send me, DM me a picture of your receipt and I will match it. You know, that experience doesn't need to exist uh, because, you know, a, a social donor advice fund could be a link that's shared where people hop in and give to a common pool. Uh, and then the, the originator wants to match it, just doubles everything in the fund mm -hmm. um, and everybody gets to see it. Um, and, it, and it's dynamic and it can be branded and tell the story. And it doesn't need to be this like piece together, you know, in inter donor advice funds. So, you know, the donor advice fund wasn't in the old paradigm in summer 2020, not relevant because the tools weren't there. Now the tools are coming and I think they can be relevant for a whole lot more social peer to peer um, and kind of donor to charity relational giving uh, that wasn't possible yesterday. I think tomorrow is going to be possible. So I think they'll continue to you know, increase their influence. Certainly that's what, that's our ambition. Yeah. And uh, at Match Nice, it's donor advised funds are, are certainly a, a massive pool of potential revenue for nonprofits that we're really interested in trying to connect the dots between. And, you know, what you said just now about like matching gifts is like a, a really interesting concept uh, to, for us to be exploring as well. Just curious for any, any thoughts you have around just like the potential for donor advised funds to play a role in uh, becoming a source for matching gifts uh, on a nonprofit's website or just in any other kind of means. I mean, you think about the different types of matches, um, you know, there, there are like what I'll call uh, large collaborative matches, like a corporate foundation matching, you know, uh, some external, you know, giving drive or something like that. Uh, like I just said, like if there's a pool that aggregates all of that, it becomes really easy for large institutional or like high net worth funders to come and step in and say, yep, that's the number. I'll double it. It's very transparent um, and everybody trusts it. So the administration and trust unlock, I think, is really big for like large funders stepping into new circumstances and feeling comfortable about doing that. That's number one. Um, number two would be employee employer matches, um, which, you know, uh, we're kind of approaching at two angles uh, long term um, that uh, an employer could match anything from an individual's donor advice fund, just sort of like um, immediately issue a grant from their donor advice fund and just double it, um, which is something that um, we've done on our platform, uh, which we think can be an even better experience going forward. And, and then second, um, you know, a, a, a corporation, you know, a community fund, a workplace is a community of sorts. And so uh, if there is a disaster response for a, a workplace um, or a particular cause that comes up where a workplace wants to jump in and get engaged, employees contribute, the company can very easily say, yep, let's let's double that um, and, and do that very, very simply. Um, and, and then last thing I'll say is it becomes really easy for uh influencers, anybody who has an audience to create a really simple workflow for folks to jump in and give and make that a part of the fabric of their community mm. and, and, and sort of contribute accordingly. Hey, I'm going to put match 50% or a hundred percent of everything that everybody contributes um, into this fund. And, and that workflow just wasn't very easily, you could do it on fundraisers, but usually those are time bound. It's like oh, 30 days, like this particular moment, this creates a social donor advice fund creates the opportunity for that to happen ongoing. They're like, hey, this is the influencer's audience foundation. This is like the thing that is going to like continue the cause moving forward uh, more permanently. So that's just a little taste of some of the things that we're building and excited about and thinking about. 
Yeah, I uh, so appreciate the the thoughtfulness behind those connections that you laid out because there's so much potential um, in totally. tapping into this matching gifts concept, particularly in the online fundraising space right now. One more ask that I had around like donor advised funds. One of the questions that's come up for me, and I think a lot of people who are maybe now like we've piqued their interest around starting a donor advised fund. The question then becomes, well, what's a good starting point? Like, I maybe I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, but like, this sounds really interesting. I want to get started. Like, uh, is $100 too little? Like, do I need $1,000 to get something like this started? Like, what's your recommendation, the approach for someone who is interested in starting a donor advised funds in terms of funding one? Maybe it doesn't have to be all at once. Maybe it can be something you contribute to over months, but just wanted to hear your thoughts in terms of like guidance or, or advice for folks that are interested, but may feel overwhelmed by like what the financial commitment might look like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, um, biased response at first, and then I'll and then I'll give you an unbiased response. Uh, you know, Charity Vest is endeavoring to remove all the friction, so um, you can create a free donor advised fund, like literally charges you zero nothing um, on Charity Vest. And that was something that we from day one wanted to make possible: a free donor advised fund. We only charge if you choose to invest it, um, but if you don't invest it, um, it is literally completely free. We send 100% of every dollar to charities that you ultimately support. Um, so start one of those. It takes 90 seconds. That's kind of where, and kick the tires. You know, we love donors that just try it out and um, see if it's for them and it simplifies giving for them. And ultimately we we think it does for most donors. So um, that'd be my my biased response, but hopefully that is is a practical invitation. Um, the, the, the second kind of uh, uh, less biased response is, I think where donor advised funds can really, really activate donors into a deeper level of giving is unlocking commitment that is not tied to specific organizations. What do I mean by that? Donor advised funds enable you to say, you know what, I really want to have a charitable legacy. I don't really know what organizations or I don't have a broad sense more than like the one that I constantly support today. Uh, and, I, you know, but I, I think I should be giving $100 a month at least, or a thousand dollars a month, at least, uh, wherever kind of you are on the on the spectrum, and commit to that number. Say, all right, I'm going to give a hundred dollars a month and make that a life goal, and and really see how this enriches my life for the next, you know, twelve months. Make a make a small goal, and set that up in a donor advice fund for it to pull a hundred dollars a month, you know, out of your checking account every month when you get paid, or you know, make that donation of stock at the end of the year. From your portfolio, um, and 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 just and let it continue to grow and invest until you're ready um, to see it give it away. But but the important thing is like make that charitable commitment and see how that unlocks your giving. And that was my mm -hmm. wife and, and my experience when we first opened a donor advised fund. And that's how I became really passionate about this space. Is once you have money set aside, it becomes such a more life giving conversation to entertain. Uh, fundraising asks. It's like no longer, you know, how is this going to affect my financial situation and whatever. It just gets the financial part of giving like totally out of the way. And it's like, am I excited about this? Am I excited to support it? If yes, send the money, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah. support it. And, uh, and it really just unlocks a layer of delight and joy in giving and ultimately, you know, we think a richer life. So, um, so hopefully that's kind of the, uh, the call to action here is use a donor advice fund and use it to commit to giving. I love the intentionality around giving that that creates and that mindset creates. So I appreciate you sharing that. Stephen, what is it that you really want your lasting legacy to be? I, I appreciate the words um, intentional that you use. I mean, we, we use the words intentional and purposeful giving as kind of our our touchstone at, at Charity Best. You know, what what are we unlocking in the world? Um, and it really is a, a level of purpose and intentionality in people's lives that I think is possible through giving. And so, um, you know, I, I get excited when somebody says, yeah, I gave a thousand bucks through Charity Vest and it was a great experience. But I get elated when I hear somebody say, you know, I was giving X and then I started using Charity Vest and uh, I really didn't have a good reason why I wasn't giving 2X. And my interaction with your product, like really 
catalyzed that behavior change for me. Um, and that's kind of the life change that that I'm most proud of is, is seeing people be click into a more purposeful and intentional mode, especially with giving and their life's legacy. So yeah, thanks for asking that. What a oh, good question. Yeah, and you all have the numbers to to prove that you can quantify your legacy. <laughs> I know Charity Best has done quite a bit to, to contribute to funds in the sector. So Stephen, I so appreciate the time that you've given uh, to me and this audience around donor advised funds and everything that you're doing. I really appreciate your insight, your commitment to democratizing donor advised funds and everything you and the Charity Vest team are doing to, to shift the landscape towards a more generous and intentional fundraising environment. Oh, thanks, Peter. It was so great to be with you. So excited about what you all are doing at Match Nice. And, uh, you know, got to, got to, uh, us fellow Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets got to stick together. So uh, maybe that's what we'll end on is go Jackets. <laughs> yeah, go Jackets. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later, Stephen. Thanks for you. How about that conversation? That wraps up episode 20 of the Nonprofit Lab. Be sure to check out Charity Vest. We'll link to their website in this episode description to learn more about how you can start your own DAF account and become more intentional and purposeful about your charitable giving. To end on a quote, as always, John C. Maxwell said, one person can inspire a second person to be intentional and another. Those people can work together. They can become a movement. They can make an impact. I hope that this episode with Stephen is one that may inspire you as part of this greater movement towards creating impact. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed and learned something new in this or other episodes, please take a moment to like, subscribe, rate, and share our podcast with the mission aligned givers in your world. With that, and as always, thank you and be well.